and thank you for giving me the opportunity to start off this summit at Johannesburg. It's great to be here, to be back. I recognize some faces from last year, but I think there are a few new faces as well. On the way here in the car, I actually thought about the Johannesburg summit last year and what has happened since the summit last year. And uh, although a year passes very quickly, I think it's evident when it comes to 5G that 5G has raised a lot of attention, speed and really gained momentum compared to where we were a year ago. So now we are much more concrete when it comes to our thinking on 5G. We, as well as other companies, are moving into test beds, starting building 5G. And there's raised interest also, not only from, from operators, but also from other industries in 5G. So given that, I think this is a perfect opportunity for us to meet here at Johannesburg, share our thoughts and views on 5G. So it's great to be here to present the Ericsson view on 5G. So what is 5G all about for us? Last year when I was here, I talked about the Network Society, Ericsson's vision for the future for 2020. And you know, in the Network Society, anything that benefits from being connected will be connected. That is our view, which means that we will have a lot of connected devices. We have estimated 50 billion by 2020, maybe even more, maybe 500 billion. And also in the Network Society, our technologies will be used for far more applications than they are today. And in our view, 5G technology and 5G systems are the systems for the network society. So the network society will be built on the 5G networks and 5G systems utilizing the 5G technology. So what does that actually mean? Well, it means that 5G will have to be able to handle a wide range of connected devices and a very wide range of end user requirements. So we're not only talking smartphones, tablets, PCs, we're talking industry robots, sensors, we are talking cars, maybe surgery, remote surgery, anything that benefits from being connected will be connected over 5G. It also means that the network has to support all of the new services for the connected devices. So we're then moving out from communication services into a scenario where other techno our technologies are used also for mission critical application, business critical, connecting cars, self-driving cars, connecting industries, maybe even remote surgery. And that, of course, poses very tough requirements on the networks. So the networks that we're talking about for 5G, the 5G networks, are networks with capabilities far beyond what we have in the networks today. And then we're not only talking about the radio access, we're also talking about the transport in the network and the network functionality. Being able to give us a service-aware, user-aware network that can optimize for different services, different users, depending on where they are in the network and depending on the end user requirements for that service to always provide the accurate experience for that particular service. Which means that the networks have to be very agile they will build on uh, virtualized cloud infrastructure, giving us the possibility to execute the network functionality distributed and in different places in the network, depending on the application that the uh, functionality is relevant for in that case. We are then also talking about the entire network between the device and the service. So we're stretching that beyond the current operator network. Of course, cloud, cloud technologies, Cloud infrastructure will be crucial for the core of the 5G networks. And we are also thinking about things, as you know, as capillary networks, where sensors in a closed environment are connected perhaps with a non-3GPP technology, but then backhauled to the system over 3GPP technology and still controlled by the 3GPP network. So looking a bit, a bit into the future, what do we think about 2019? Well, our view is that by 2019, we will have at least a 10 times growth in mobile data traffic compared to where we are today. And already now, uh, at least I experience, and I'm sure I share that experience with you, that some of the networks are already now pretty hard loaded. And so at least 10 times 
in uh, mobile data by 2019, and the major part of this will be video traffic. We also estimate that we will have over 5 billion or 5.6 billion smartphone subscriptions by 2019, 8 billion mobile broadband subscri subscriptions, and this actually means that basically every person over four years, between four and 95, on the world will have a smartphone. And that is pretty amazing. It's only five years from now. So it's coming into all hands of all people, and there will be an enormous growth in the subscriptions as well. So what about the networks by 2019? Well, by 2019, in almost all regions of the world, we will see coverage dominated by 3G and 4G technologies. In some mature markets, like for instance North America, we will have 85% coverage of LTE of 4G, and possibly also in Japan, Korea, other early adopters of, of LTE. So this is already by 2019, which means that for 5G we have to stretch beyond this. But this is the situation we will have by 2019. Of course, the LTE by 2019 will not be exactly the LTE or 4G that we have today, because it will be continuously evolved in the 3GPP in the coming releases, and also incorporates technology components that may also come into 5G technologies, but a bit earlier also in LTE technology. So it's not exactly the same LTE technology. But very good coverage of 3G and LTE by 2019. Coming back then to the requirements for 5G to be able to cope with all of the different connected devices and services, we see that 5G has to be extremely fast, provide amazingly high data rates, up to 10 gigabit per second or maybe even beyond, for some specific applications needing that. 5G also has to support extremely high capacity to work in a big crowd, for instance in an Olympic arena, maybe sensors on the athletes, but also lots of people in the audience uploading video to the system, huge capacity demand, and maybe also in the disaster situation. 5G has to support massive machine communication, machine to machine, and in this case we have illustrated it by a Maersk vessel carrying an, uh, an Ericsson system and sensors in all of the containers which means that they can keep track of the containers, where they are, are they on the ship, in the harbor, or perhaps even in the sea, and also the conditions in the containers. So this will be even more adopted, of course, by 2020. But also there will be another type of machine communication that relies on super real time and, and really high reliability, which means maybe latency is down to one millisecond and five ninths of reliability. So very vast and different requirements on the 5G systems. Talking a bit about machine type communication, there are actually very dis different aspects of machine type communication. One aspect is of course the more massive numbers, low cost devices, small data volumes, low energy, and the system of course has to support that by providing very long range, low protocol overhead, scalable access, and an affordable solution to connect all of these small sensors. Then, there's also the other case, where we talk about machine-type communication, but really for high-performance, very high-demanding services, for mission-critical applications and for business-critical applications. And here we are, have to support ultra-reliable networks, extremely high availability, and very, very short latency. And this can be, for instance, industry applications, or car communication, or tactile internet. And those requirements are quite different between these two cases, but both of them are definitely 5G. So what can we expect from 5G? What kind of requirements do we have to support? Here we have tried to illustrate the requirements for 3G, 4G, and 5G, in this graph. The dark green are the requirements for 3G, light green for 4G, and the yellow is then, then tries to illustrate the requirements for 5G. And as you can see, we have to 
exceed the requirements for 3G and for 4G by more than a magnitude in some cases, and also in very many dimensions. So 5G has to exceed the performance and characteristics, of course, of legacy technologies in all aspects by as much as one magnitude or even more in some cases. And it's both the expansion of mobile broadband, which is more up here, capacity, data rates, spectrum and bandwidth flexibility, but also supporting requirements for machine type communication, the massive number of devices, and the mission critical applications such as latency and reliability. If we are talking about supporting extremely high data rates, extremely high capacities, we will need more spectrum. Of course, we will need to go up in bandwidth, and that may be very difficult to fit in in the lower frequency ranges. So talking about 5G, we see that there is a very wide spectrum range that may be relevant for 5G, stretching from where we are today up to beyond 10 gigahertz, up to 30 gigahertz, and maybe even beyond that. So from where we are today up to millimeter waves may be relevant for 5G spectrum. And then the question is, will this be one radio interface for this wide frequency range? Well, our view is that, as you know, and we talked about this previously, that 5G builds on the evolution of existing standards but then also complementing with new technologies. So our view is that in the frequency range basically from where we are today and up to perhaps 30 gigahertz, it will be an evolution of the 5G cellular access, giving us higher performance, higher coverage and extending the characteristics of the 5G cellular access. Whereas when we come to the millimeter wavelength area, we think that this may be something that has lower complexity, that is more suitable for short range, for, for indoor and for spotty coverage. We also think that in the frequency bands below perhaps 6 gigahertz, it would be very beneficial to have LTE compatibility, since we will have LTE coverage by such a vast range of the world's population by 2019. Looking a bit into the network architecture for 5G, since I talked about that 5G is not only the radio access, it's also about the network architecture, the transport and so on. In our view, we will have a network architecture where we have 5G radio access, we have legacy radio access technologies and maybe also fixed access, all supported by the same common 5G core layer, core functionality also supported by common 5G management and transport for all of the accesses. Within 5G radio access, we need to build this as one network, the seamless mobility and common resource management between the different modes, although they may be built on slightly different radio access technologies for the 5G cellular and the millimeter wave, but still one network, scalable, seamless mobility. For the core functionality, we need to have this service-centric approach where the network functionality will be highly relevant to, to realize the new services, even though maybe not all services may be initiated or driven by the operators, the 5G services will depend on the network functionality to give the right performance for that specific service, which means that it needs to hook into the network and make use of the network functionality. So for 5G, our view is that the network and the network functionality will be even more important for the future. We also need to build this in a flexible way, which means that we will build it on a virtualized cloud infrastructure, giving us the opportunity to have functionality execute in a distributed way and also on different places in the network, depending on the specific, specific service that needs to be supported. Of course, our functionality of today will be most likely virtualized by 2020. We'll build on virtualized network functions and we will have networks built in the SDN style with a common control layer. We are now moving into building testbeds 
together with other companies, and I think we may hear more about that later on today, also by Nakamura-san. And why are we building test beds? Well, of course, it is important for us to start early, to learn. See, what are the diffi difficulties with building a 5G system? To investigate what are the propagation aspects in these high frequency ranges. We will build a test bed on, on around 15 gigahertz as the first step, and that will be ready by before year end this year. And of course, to demonstrate high data rates. And this is actually uh, uh, quite amazing that we and other companies as well are already now moving into starting building 5G test beds because that will enable us to learn a lot already before 2020. So when can we expect 2020? As you know, we are in 3GPP working continuously on new releases, improving the functionality of the 3GPP systems, and that will of course continue throughout the years. We will also start study items in 3GPP, both on the 5G requirements and the 5G technologies, and then move into work items to specify the 5G systems. At the same time, ITU is working on the requirements for 5G, specifying requirements, evaluation criteria, and then working with the proposals and evaluation, ending up with the specifications ready by 2020. And as you know, new spectrum, when we talk about that, we are thinking about the World Radio Conference 2015 and the World Radio Conference 2018 and 19. So, to summarize, I think we are, uh, it, it's really interesting to see the attention that 5G is now catching, not only amongst us, but also in other parts of the society, and I think we're moving ahead. I think we know a lot more than we did a year ago when we were here. We have learned a lot, and we are learning even more. So, we are in good shape to meet the market and society needs by 2020. It will be a combination of evolving the cellular technologies plus adding new technologies for the high frequency range, but also adding components, of course, into the uh, cellular frequency bands. And we have been working with 5G research for some years now, both within Ericsson, but also in, for instance, the METIS project and in other projects. And we are now moving into test beds. And the first heads, test beds will be end ready before year end. And that will be really interesting to see what we learn from that. Thank you.